those of you who know my work know that I direct a project, a multidisciplinary project on the South Coast. And Pinnacle Point is one of the localities that we work at. And uh, we do all the things that you've been talking about, isotopes, fauna, stones. We even do tephra, right? We found toba in the sites um, that we published back in 2018. But I'm not going to talk about any of that. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give a theoretical talk, and I want to thank Rob Foley for being the first person to get up and give a talk like that. It's probably almost as dangerous as jumping into a wood chipper. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about culture and how culture is probably the primary driver of the last key phase in human evolution, which is the transition uh, to people, people like us. So in the talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the question, what do we mean by a modern human? Because I think we've got some confusion in that area. I'm going to talk about the significance of what I'm going to call the modern human triad, which, I'm going to, which has three parts, hyper-prosociality, a slavish reliance on social learning, and modern human cognition. I'm going to explain why I think climate change is not it is not the driver or is an insignificant driver of the evolution of the triad. And then I'm going to argue that the final step to modern humans must have been caused by cultural change, not climate change. So we have Homo sapiens and modern humans, and they're not necessarily the same thing. So Homo sapiens are defined by anatomical features that fall within the range of variation of modern humans. But modern humans, are defined by psychological, emotional, and cognitive characteristics that fall within the range of modern humans. And given that, we can assert that it's possible, even likely, that there were populations of Homo sapiens that were not modern humans in the late Middle Pleistocene and late Pleistocene. And we can also come to the conclusion that modern humans must have been a population of Homo sapiens. They must have evolved in Africa. And they must have evolved before 70,000 years ago or before the great human diaspora, before modern humans left Africa. These are kind of assertions that we can deduce from some very specific points. So Homo sapiens is defined by anatomy. There's lots of people in this audience that know a lot more about that than I do. We've heard a couple of talks. Um, and But most of the features that people use aren't related to the way that we define modern humans. They're not related to psychological and emotional and cognitive features. But back in 2018, I read this very interesting paper by Neubauer et al. And it's one of the few that really possibly makes a connection between anatomy and those things that we need to use to define modern humans. And that's the origin of the globular brain case, which they argue, they co-associate it with the evolution of a modern human cognition. Okay, so that possibly is an anatomical feature that we can think of. So let me dig a little bit more into what I'm saying is the definition of modern humans. Um, an innate proclivity to cooperate at very high scales with unrelated individuals is what I mean by hyperpro sociality. And what we're doing right here is hyperpro sociality. We're getting together with unrelated individuals, sharing information, it's costly, et cetera. It's really hard to explain that the evolution of that behavior uh, with animals. An innate slavish reliance on social learning through high fidelity copying behavior. I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but if you've had kids, you know what I'm talking about. And then the most advanced organic ability to acquire knowledge and understanding. That's what we often call an advanced cognition, I think we probably just want to say the way we understand it, it's a modern human cognition. That's what we have among all living people um, today. So I call that the modern human triad. That's the three features. In a sense, I'm using them like anatomical features, but they're behavioral, right? Um, and when we take a modern human cognition and we add it to that special psychology for social learning, and we then add on to that extreme cooperation, what we do is we create the capacity for modern human cumulative culture. That's our unique adaptation that allowed us to spread out of Africa 
and start to make our way into outer space. And that, no other animal, no other extant animal has that. That's unique to us. We need to explain how it came to be. So these three capacities and proclivities, they're embedded in the genome. They're evolved, just like anatomical features. Therefore, they are subject to evolutionary explanation, just like all the things we've been talking about. So that gives us a great research question. When, where, and how did the modern human triad evolve? And like I've asserted, climate change is insufficient, and I think I can make a good case for that going forward. So modern human cognition, you already know pretty much what that is. Extraordinary ability to acquire and process knowledge, store it inside and outside the mind, retrieve it and use it. Creativity is a part of it. Ability to use uh, analogy, right, symbolic behavior. Um, and this one has received a lot of attention in the archaeological literature. So if you go through the, what we've been doing in the Middle Stone Age for the last 40 years, we're always talking about cognition. But I think we've put too much emphasis on it. It's important, but the triad is more important. So extreme cooperation, what I've just used the word hyperprosociality. This is an emotional complex of usness, groupness. Right? It's the foundation of tribalistic, nationalistic feelings. And boy, do we see them on the rise today, right? They have good things about them, and they have really bad things about them. It allows high levels of cooperation with non-kin. And I think really importantly, it allows a special form of cooperative breeding. And there's lots of different kinds of cooperative breeding. But what I mean is formal mate exchange, what we call in anthropology reciprocal exogamy. That is the foundation of multi-scale sociality and extended social networks, which allows us to form ethno-linguistic groups and tribes, which again is unique. So to give you an illustration of how this works, chimps have no hyperprosociality, and they have single level sociality. So chimps, chimps live in troops, what we call troops. If they were humans, we call those bands. And at the contact of those troops, they have conflict, warfare, right? As was first documented by Jane Goodall. Modern humans are very different. We have hyperprosociality, which allows multi-scale society. So we live in troops slash bands. But formal mate exchange, reciprocal exogamy, ties those troops or bands together and unites them into ethno-linguistic groups. And it's at the boundary of those tribes that we see conflict. It's a very, that's what we mean by multi-scale society. This is the original universal human social structure. And if you want to read a great uh, scholarly treatment of it, Bernard Shaw Pace 2008 book, Primeval Kinship, is just a home run. So 2015, I think it was, Richard Leakey's 70th birthday, I was so, so lucky to be invited uh, to go to the Royal Academy and give a talk in honor of that. Thank you so much. It was a highlight of my, my life. Um, and I gave a talk on um, kind of the first part of this, this talk. Uh, and what I argued is, is that late in human evolution, the addition of dense and predictable resources was a fourth dietary revolution. And it created, set up a selection regime for hyperprosociality. And that eventually led to the great human diaspora. And I, I published a paper in the special issue that came out of that. So basically, the hypothesis that I argued was is that uh, hyperprosociality evolved uniquely in the modern human lineage among modern humans. So it's the modern human derived condition. And when uh, hyperprosocial multi scale societies come into conflict with single level societies. They always win because they can put more warriors in the field. And that results in the extinction of single level societies. So, my hypothesis was that Neanderthals retained the original primitive form, very low or no hyperprosociality, single level society like chimps. And when modern humans came out of Africa, Neanderthals and all the other megafauna and so on didn't have a chance. And humans spread across the world. They killed all their competitors and, of course, killed 
the top of the food chain. That's why we see megafaunal extinctions. So why is climate change insufficient to explain the evolution of the triad? So to make this argument, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize an enormous amount of theory and comparative ethnography um, and draw primarily on theory that we call human macroecology, human behavioral ecology, standard comparative ethnography, right, that from cultural anthropology and evolutionary psychology. So I'm going to, I'm going to blow through an enormous amount of material, but it's published in some of those, those papers. But first, I just want to ask the question, what is behavioral and cultural complexity? We have a technological realm. That's the number of parts and raw materials that make up a tool. We have a social realm. That's the amount of economic and political differentiation. We have institutional realm. That's the number of rules and regulations and norms that, that are structured in society. And of course, we are super complex societies with thousands and millions of these things. And other societies range in variation in that. So among hunter-gatherers, we have very complex hunter-gatherers like these Inuit and Tlingit. Tlingit are northwest coast hunter-gatherers. Their diets are normally aquatic uh, plus terrestrial. They're just aquatic sometimes. They have lots of storage. Their technologies are heavy. They have very few residential moves. Sometimes they live all year in villages. Band sizes are large, 100 people or more. They live in small, tightly packed societies. They're non-egalitarian. So they're stratified, sometime even at the level of chiefdom. And warfare is typically very high. Non-complex hunter-gatherers that dominate the tropics, all of Africa, their diets are normally terrestrial plants and animals. They show little and short-term storage. The technology is very light. Everything can be carried by one person. Residential moves are many. They move about 10 to 50 times a year. Band sizes are small. Territory sizes are really large. They're usually egalitarian, and they have, which means they have little social differentiation. Everybody's equal. And warfare levels are low to non-existent. So on this graph, um, I'm just going to show you one example of how we drive up complexity. Um, each dot is a tribal group. It's an ethnolinguistic group on each of the graphs. On that y-axis is increasing technological complexity. It's, it's a measure called techno units. It's just the number of parts and raw materials that make up a, a tool. So as you go up, it's getting more um, complex. On that y-axis is effective temperature with a proxy for seasonality. And in that box, we have Africa. It's warm, no snow, very, very, very warm, aseasonal environments. Those are the colder environments. That's actually where Neanderthals would be living. So colder swings between winter and summer, high temperature latitudes, or, or high latitudes. On that axis, we have the percentage of diet that is fishing or shellfishing, so percentage aquatic. Now, if we take all of the African climate variability over time, which we've heard tons about over the last few days, it never gets outside that box that you see there, never, even during glacial phases. So in Africa, there is no climate change that would drive hunter-gatherer complexity above that tropical adaptation that I just talked about. What that means is, is that climate could never have driven hunter-gatherers in Africa to be complex hunter-gatherers. It cannot be. It's off the table, at least what we know from data and theory. The only way, the only game in town is to add aquatic resources to the diet. That's the only way you ratchet up complexity among hunter-gatherer societies. So why do aquatic resources cause complexity? They're dense and predictable resources, almost always. They trigger warfare. The hunter-gatherers fight like crazy when they become aquatic hunter-gatherers. That's documented in animal ethnography. It's documented in the comparative ethnography. And it's supported by one of the most powerful theories in behavioral ecology called the theory of economic defendability. It reduces mobility. It often requires more complex tools. And reduced mobility allows you to make more complex, heavier tools. So you get a feedback mechanism. So the, low, the more you reduce mobility, the bigger complex technology you can get. And then you can be more and more sedentary. And it drives populations up. So, in Africa, 
fishing and coastal foraging are the only pathways to hunter-gatherer higher complexity in Africa. Fishing, systematic fishing, particularly the big fish, requires complex technology. But using the intertidal zone does not. All you need to be able to do is figure out the relationship between lunar cycles and tidal rates. And I've, written, I've published extensively on that. And if any of you live near the ocean, you know what I'm talking about. So when do these occur? Systematic coastal adaptations in South Africa dot, date all the way back to 160,000 years ago. And Pinnacle Point is still the first site, the earliest site that we have for systematic coastal foraging. In North Africa, we have a broken record, but there seems to be around 110,000 years ago, a commitment to coastal resources, and then it really kicks in 25,000. Um, systematic riverine lake adaptations, uh, Sahara Nile Valley, after 25,000, Central Africa, East Africa, it's all pretty consistent um, there, but there is the one observation at Katanda, published back in the 1990s, where they have fishbone, Middle Stone Age, really old OSL dates, I mean old in the sense that early on in the development of OSL, and I'm gonna assert that we need confirmation. That needs a validation study to see it. So I think our first foray and to the dense and predictable resource zone occurred in South Africa 160,000 years ago to 125,000 years ago at the origin point of what I would say would be the transition to a truly modern human as defined by the emotional and psychological complex that has to be in place to be one of us, to be able to operate in a society uh, like we have. And many of you have heard me coming around and pestering you about you know, do you have fishing sites in the Middle Stone Age? That's why I'm so interested in those. We need to do research on that topic in East Africa, because East Africa is the place is where we're gonna see it, because they have really rich, potentially rich fishing cultures. So I'm just gonna summarize the big story as the way I see it. What I've been listening to for the last four days, which has been absolutely fascinating, and thank you so much for the crash course on Turkana, is this. From 3.5 million years ago to 200,000 years ago, we had a tropical terrestrial hunter-gatherer, a little bit more ape-like early on, a little bit more modern human-like a little, a little later, focused on terrestrial plants and animals. There was very little storage. Light technology was very light, carried by one person. Eventually they invented bags and so on to carry a few things. A lot of residential moves, you know, moving the camp and the family. Small band size, 20 to 30, large territories. But this is a key thing, and, I, and no one's been talking about it, but this is an absolutely essential evolutionary step. We know that the shared common ancestor had to have the primitive ape stratified society like chimps. But tropical hunter-gatherers are egalitarian and they have all these really complex cultural rules for leveling people to keep it egalitarian. When did that evolve? That's a breakthrough. I don't know if we can get that from the archeological record, but we certainly need to be thinking about it. Okay, and that probably happened as you know a tropical hunter-gatherer. But here's my point. Modern humans are psychologically and cognitively over-engineered for that niche. We inhabit it effectively, but we're over-engineered for it. And those things that we have, that, that brain size and the emotions and so on, it's costly. And you wouldn't evolve it unless there was some selection regime for it. So that niche cannot be the evolution of modern humans. So the evolution of modern humans requires a cultural niche of greater complexity. Increasing reliance on aquatic foods, which will trigger increasing sedatism, increasing technological complexity, increasing social and institutional complexity, increasing warfare, which is unfortunate, but it just happens. And that sets up the selection regime for hyper-prosocial psychology and selection for high levels of complex social learning. So the hominid adaptation at that time was a consistent reliance on tropical terrestrial food niche, 
that results in a very slow ratcheting of the cultural niche. The slow ratcheting of the cultural niche drives slow cognitive increases, slow cranial increases. That's what we see with early homo and homo erectus. The slow ratchet of cultural niche drives slow shifts in the form of social learning toward the modern human form. And at 300,000 years ago, we have a homo sapiens like Jebelir Hood, large brain moving to a globular form, um, but in my opinion, still retains the primitive ape form of low prosociality and lack of multi-scale society. Troops, not tribes. Final steps, that, that slow evolution of a complex cognition eventually allows people to break into the dense and predictable food niche. That creates the selection regime for aquatic hunter-gatherer adaptations and hyper-prosociality and, and complex social learning. Eventually, that blossoms into the formation of tribal social structure, right? Multi-scale social structure. And all the complex tools that come with it that get added to that, and that then triggers the great human diaspora. So my conclusions are, modern humans are defined by the modern human triad. Anatomy is part of it, but it's not the key part of the final move. These characters are evolved psychological, emotional, and cognitive characteristics, and they require evolutionary explanations just like anatomical features. Climate change doesn't make it as an explanation for this. It had to be a cultural change, and I think the most parsimonious cultural change would be a shift to dense and predictable resources that drove the last steps to modern humans. And uh, in recognition of that, I'm happy to say that in March, uh, we just submitted a World Heritage nomination, uh, and we um, called it the Cradle of Human Culture for the modern human origin sites in South Africa. And Pinnacle Point is one of the main sites in that. It's a serial nomination. is one of the main sites. So I want to thank uh, my friends and colleagues in TBI uh, so much for inviting me to this wonderful conference and all the other, my team in Mazel Bay and my, my uh, uh, supporting grants and staff. So thank you very much.